Okay. Moby Dick Lecture 17. This is our second to last Moby Dick Lecture, I believe. Uh, it doesn't have a title yet, actually. I'll have to come up with something here before I post it. Um, I just want to pick right up where we left off last time, uh, which is chapter 119, The Candles. The Pequod has been sailing east from Nantucket, following the migrating paths of, of whales, and is now off the coast of Japan in this chapter, where Ahab believes he will at last encounter Moby Dick. To get there, to get to Japan, they have sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, down the west coast of Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope. They have cruised across the Indian Ocean and are heading northward um, before breaking out now into the Pacific Ocean, up near Southeast Asia, near Japan. These seas are known for their typhoons. And there's a great description on page 507 where Melville talks about um, a typhoon that will, will sometimes burst from out of that cloudless sky like an exploding bomb upon a dazed and sleepy town. Now there's no way on earth that Melville could have known about the atomic bombs bursting in the sky above Hiroshima and Nagasaki about 95 years later. Um, still, as modern readers, it's tough to, to read that passage today about exploding bombs over days and sleepy Japanese towns um, to uh, without like having some sort of unsettling image um, of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki coming to mind. As you know, uh, mid 20th, 20th century Moby Dick readers would come to see in the white whale a symbol for our species um, collectively mad, potentially suicidal pursuit of nuclear technologies. Uh, we may indeed strike through the mask in Ahab's words. We may indeed be able to peer down into the world's atomic foundations, but perhaps we pursue this at our own peril. There seem to be forces around us, even perhaps within us, that, that we can see through to understand, but we can't fully control. And, and that's sort of the human predicament in a nutshell. That's why Moby Dick like, continues to speak to us, right? We are smart enough to know that we shouldn't do certain things, but we're not smart enough to not do them. Uh, that's not just like being a teenager. That's, that's the kernel of every human story ever told from, from Genesis onward, pretty much, right? We know we shouldn't eat the apple, but we're gonna eat it anyway. And look at all these interesting new consequences that now we're gonna have to live with. It's a messy and kind of fun sometimes thing, this being human, but um, you'd think we would learn sooner or later uh, from these stories or from our experience. Maybe next time, uh, uh, maybe we'll just have to pay more attention to, to Moby Dick and to Genesis. Um, it seems weird in a way uh, to think that it's less than a hundred years maybe from, from Moby Dick to, to the atomic bomb. Uh, maybe a hundred years sounds like a long time to you. And, and yeah, sure it is, um, true. Uh, actually though, Melville died in the 1890s. So that's only 50 years that separate this guy who went around on like wooden boats spearing whales to nuclear technology right, in 50 years. Um, Einstein, Albert Einstein, I, I, I want to say he was born in, in the late 1800s, maybe the 1870s um, even. And so he and Melville were, were certainly alive at, at the same time for a bit there. They overlapped, right? Think about that. Einstein and Melville. Um, Einstein probably used whale oil to do his math homework at night as a kid. Uh, who knows? Uh, and how quickly we got there from, from like uh, whale oil to uh, mushroom clouds over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We'll talk more um, about the, the, that, that pace of change when we get to modernism next year, the sheer acceleration of life between the late 1800s and like the, the late 1900s, you know, around, around the time that I was born. Um, modern life has actually really slowed down um, quite a bit in the 21st century. In, in your lifetimes, although I, I know it doesn't feel like it sometimes, but but right, pretty much no new invention has really just fundamentally changed the way we live the same way that like the internal combustion engine did, or or antibiotics, or plastic, or all these things that that were coming in, you know, around the turn of the century, um, between you know 1850, 1950, that kind of <clears throat> um, time frame. 
Of course, that could all change in a heartbeat. And, and it, with like gene editing technology and artificial intelligence and that sort of stuff, things could change very quickly um, at any point. Uh, and it'd be great, I think, if things didn't change too much too quickly. I'm pretty attached to this lovely world that we have here, though it, you know, it could use some technological and ethical improvements here and there. Who knows? Anyway, the point is that, that Moby Dick um, uh, raises these questions of, 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 what, of what a responsible pursuit um, of, of nature looks like, of what you know, mastery over nature might look like um, in, in its promise and its peril. Um, and it does this in a way that is still quite relevant, um, or so it seems to many educated people who continue to find in this novel a useful template for thinking about um, our most urgent uh, moral questions. So, okay, um, all that to say, the Pequot is caught all of a sudden in this typhoon um, that explodes like a bomb in the sky, and she gets her sails ripped off because there really is no way to get them down in time. This thing hits them so fast. Starbuck is standing watch on the deck while Stubb and Flask are running around securing all the riggings. Stubb is singing through the storm, of course, and Starbuck tells him to get to work and let the storm do the singing. And Stubb says, nothing will stop me from singing. Uh, he's like your little brother in the backseat of the car on a road trip and like five hours into it is still singing. Um, at which point Starbuck starts pointing out all these like bad omens to kind of like quell some of Stubb's jollity. Um, you know, one of the Pequod's four small whale boats gets stove in the storm, and wouldn't you know it, it's Ahab's boat. That's a bad sign connected to Ahab, and the storm is also coming from the east, where Moby Dick is, and they're, they're sailing into this storm. Uh, if they would turn around and not pursue Moby Dick, the storm that's threatening right th them right now would actually be helping them um, speed home with the wind at their backs. So Starbucks sees a light in the west in the direction of, of Nantucket and a darkness in the east where Moby Dick lurks, where Ahab is taking them. And when the wind begins to blow, I think he's saying, you know, we have a choice. Do we sail into the wind or do we sail against the wind? We can't actually control the wind, but we can choose what direction our prow is pointing when the wind comes. Notice um, that once again in this chapter, as in the Bloom chapter, um, we are quite consciously dealing with questions of hermeneutics, of interpretation, right? Starbuck is interpreting the signs he sees around him very differently than Stubb does, who is singing, uh, or Ahab, who is urging them onward into the storm. Remember that in the book of Job, uh, God speaks to Job in a whirlwind, in a storm, in the voice of, of a tornado. Um, and pious Starbuck uh, sees this typhoon as God's voice, declaring against Ahab that they must turn around. And the crew almost for a moment joins Starbuck in turning the ship towards safety and sanity and home. They, they're actually like described as half mutinous um, at one point on page 513, I believe, um, because they're so freaked out by this storm, at least until Ahab grabs his flaming harpoon and reminds them in a speech about their unbreakable oath, blood oath to hunt the white whale. And they're actually even more freaked out by Ahab than by the storm. And so they scatter and they lose their nerve for mutiny. Um, you remember that this harpoon is made by the blacksmith, especially for Ahab to kill Moby Dick, because in an epic, you always need like, you know, a sword. And uh, this one has been baptized in the name of the devil. <clears throat> it's been tempered in pagan's blood. And, and now here it is flaming, literally on fire from, from the lightning in Ahab's hand, like a forked tongue. Uh, I think it's described as, um, so it's like a serpent or a devil. And, and it just, yeah, like Melville can really create a big mood of evil when he wants to. There's nothing really hermeneutically ambiguous about that, right? You don't have to be like, like a literature professor to read those signs. Um, the main sign here that needs interpreting though is the eerie fire that has, that has taken hold of the ship. Um, there's a reason why this chapter is called the candles. It, it's a reference to this like kind of cool weather phenomenon called St. Elmo's fire, uh, or as Stubb calls it, the corpuscence, uh, which makes the Pequod's masts look like they're burning at the top, like, like candles, like they're spewing flame. Um, and apparently this is not an uncommon experience. Many sailors see this in lightning storms, there's actually a scientific explanation for it, namely that, um, you know, I could quote Wikipedia, it says, you know, the electronic field around an object causes ionization of the air molecules, producing a fast, a faint glow. 
Visible in low light conditions, conditions that can generate St. Elmo's fire are present during thunderstorms where high voltage differentials are present between clouds and the ground underneath, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the article goes on to mention that St. Elmo's fire is generally a good sign. It is an auspicious omen indicating that your ship is under the protection of St. Elmo, who is the patron saint of sailors. Once more, we're back to hermeneutics here. Um, you know, the facts are the facts. There's lightning and there's differentials and plasma and, you know, voltage. And, um, but how do we interpret those facts? Do we interpret them as a good omen of St. Saint Elmo or do we interpret them as an evil omen? And Starbuck interprets these events slightly differently. He sees them as demonic, the, the way that there's this unearthly glow around the ship. They're, they're unnatural. And Ahab sees the opposite. Ahab says that the white lights that are the candles burning on the Pequod's masts will, will guide them to the white whale. And he addresses this mysterious source of the lights in this like fantastically occult uh, and strange oration. This is like on, on page 512, uh, where he says, um, O thou spirit of clear fire, thou clear spirit, I know thee, and I now know that thy right to worship is defiance. To neither love nor reverence wilt thou be kind, and even for hate thou canst but kill, and all are killed. No fearless fool now fronts thee. I own thy speechless, placeless power, but to the last gasp of my earthquake life will dispute its unconditional, unintegral mastery in me. In the midst of the personified impersonal, a personality stands here. O thou clear spirit of thy fire, thou madest me, and like a true child of fire, I breathe it back to thee. And he goes on, he says, you know, uh, thou canst blind, but I can then grope. Thou canst consume, but I can then be ashes. Uh, you know, he says, uh, um, you know, light though thou be, thou leapest out of darkness, but I am darkness leaping out of light, leaping out of thee. Uh, uh, I leap with thee, I burn with thee, would fain be welded with thee, defyingly I worship thee. Wow. Okay, it is quite a speech. And who is he addressing in this speech? And he seems to be addressing his creator, the, the, the power, the eternal light that, that made the world. And he's saying, look, you made me free and my highest use of my freedom is to defy you, is to spit the, the light that you gave to me back at you. The right worship is defiance of fire thou made me and like a true child of fire, I'm gonna burn back at you. Um, wow. Uh, uh, in other words, right, you, you made me to be a man, to be Ahab, and not a mountain or like an insect or some other impersonal entity. Uh, you know, he says, uh, the greatest thing that a man can do is to, to burn, um, to, to assert himself as an individual in, in the midst of the personified impersonal. I, I got to assume that that's nature, right? Nature is just like the personified impersonal. Ahab stands, says, a personality stands here and defies you. For Ahab, the highest thing a creature can do with their freedom is to use it to judge and reject and defy their creator and set themselves up in equality with the creator. I mean, it's a really sort of prideful, Luciferian speech in some ways. Um, to sort of explain it a little bit further, um, I want to bring in this little quotation from, from um, the, the existentialist philosopher Soren Kierkegaard. We've talked about Kierkegaard before. We're going to read him next year. And he's got this little book. Uh, it's called The Sickness Unto Death, um, in which he describes a condition he, he calls the will to be oneself the will to be oneself. And when we hear that, we might think at first, yeah, that's a good thing, right? Be yourself. Uh, and that's true. We all get that. But um, Kierkegaard and Melville, like John Milton before them, are really interested in the shadow side of being oneself, of, of willing oneself into being, um, that is potentially of willing oneself into being, um, that is potentially blasphemous and, and Luciferian. You know, if you think of that line in Paradise Lost where, where um, Satan says, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven, right? Better to hold on to your pain as yours than to give it up and join the chorus of praise in heaven. Better to will to be oneself 
instead of uh, instead of to be in communion. Um, Kierkegaard uh, has this great analogy here, which captures Ahab's character so, so perfectly. Um, and he wrote this quote that I'm about to read you. He wrote it in 1849, so it's one year before Moby Dick was published. Um, uh, so it's not clearly exactly about Ahab, but, but it just fits so well. Um, Kierkegaard says, um, of the will to be oneself, he says, quote, it is as if an author were to make a slip of the pen and that this clerical error became conscious of being such. Perhaps it was no error, but a far higher sense uh, was an essential component of the whole exposition. It is then as if this clerical error would revolt, <clears throat> would revolt against the author out of hatred for him, would forbid him to correct it, and would say, no, I will not be erased. I will stand as a witness against thee that thou art a very poor writer. Isn't that what Ahab's saying? He says, I will not be erased. I will stand in witness against thee, God, that thou art a very poor creator because here I am, your broken creation. And don't even try to heal me. Don't even try to fix me. I will will to be oneself. I will spit fire back at you uh, rather than be you know, um, healed and reconciled. This is Ahab to a T. Uh, he's become so acutely conscious of, of suffering and evil and pain that, that he'll defy his creator, um, in effect becoming like, like uh, a sentence telling its author, you know, you've made a very poor um, um, bit of writing here. And he says, Ahab says, you know, my pain is real and I will make my complaint. I will not be erased. I want it on record just as a witness to how unfair this life actually is. And so let my refusal um, uh, to let that go become almost an act of, of holy defiance, of holding God to account for this universe he's created. Ahab would rather live with the truth of his pain than, than be healed of it. And he's willing to pay that price. Um, and he wants to live in that, that kingdom of damage that we talked about last time. It's a pretty bold move that he's making in this chapter, The Candles. Let's get down to some more um, kind of down to earth matters. Chapter 123, the musket. Remember when Ahab pointed a loaded musket at Starbuck? It was very recently, like last week. Um, and now the tables have turned a little bit. Starbuck has a loaded musket here and Ahab is asleep in his cabin. Starbuck now is, is no fool, and, and he's got pretty good evidence that Ahab has, has like dashed his heavenly quadrant. Uh, he's made a pact with the devil. He's on a suicide mission. Um, oh, yeah, that was like a great detail from the candles chapter, right? Ahab doesn't deploy the lightning rods in, um, in the storm, right? The ship has these lightning rods to keep it safe if they get struck, uh, but Ahab is like, you know, I dare you, you know, strike me with lightning, right? He's defying God saying, come fry us if you dare. And, and God or no God, that lightning is real and they could very well have been toast. So Starbuck sees this and, um, you know, at this point he realizes that Ahab has, has really forfeited any legal and moral authority that he had as captain of the ship. Um, and the thought occurs to Starbuck, maybe I should make a kind of trade trade one life, Ahab's, for the other 30 guys on the ship, including me. Starbuck thinks, should I pull this trigger and become murderer to save others so that I can go home and see my wife and dear child again, and so can they? After all, Ahab's going to destroy Starbuck's family too, if Starbuck is no more. Starbuck weighs this, and his arm is shaking, but he doesn't go through with it, of course. Um, Melville doesn't actually give us a whole lot of commentary on this scene. He kind of sets up this very tense, dramatic situation and then leaves it up to the reader to decide um, what call Starbuck has made and why and whether he, he's made the right call. Um, it's tempting for me to like want to say more here, but I'm, I'd sort of further hear your thoughts about this in the response sheets because um, I don't know that I fully get what's, what is, what we're supposed to take away here. Um, is Starbuck a morally good person for not musketing Ahab then and there when he has the chance? Or is he like a morally deficient person who puts like his abstract ethical ideals and self image as like a good man and like not a murderer ahead of the survival of the crew and like the immediate needs of his family um, to have him come home? I don't know. I'm not sure what we're supposed to think of this scene. Um, 
maybe we can sort of set up the problem in this way, right? Like if you take a modern ethics course in college, there are broadly speaking two schools of thought um, about these sort of ethical quandaries, um, at least to begin. Um, there's like the first school, you could call it utilitarianism, where you ask like, what is the greatest good for the greatest number of people here? Is it better to kill one and save 30 for the utilitarian? The answer is yes, right? Starbuck wouldn't actually be doing anything wrong in murdering Ahab because right and wrong are not inherent in the act of murder itself, but are rather the outcome um, that the act produces. It's, it's utility, right? It's use value, like, like the stuff that the consequences that happen from the act. That's where right and wrong come in. It's like you see what the consequences are. So like if a given act, even if it's a murder, um, produces a greater amount of good for a greater amount of people, then it is ends up being right, you know, and you can see why the utilitarian instinct uh, might be onto something here that, that if Starbuck kills this one guy, 30 guys get saved and yeah, it sucks, but there are trade-offs in life and you've got to go with what is, is going to be the most utility um, producing decision, utilitarianism, right? Um, uh, you know, for the utilitarian, that's just what right and wrong mean, right? It's not something intrinsically in the act itself. It's just um, right and wrong are, are like borrowed um, from the results of the act, from the consequence, from the utility. Is this good? Does this produce good or bad in the world? Does the action um, increase suffering or decrease suffering? And that's what right and wrong mean for the utilitarian. The opposite school of thought um, would be, you know, I guess you could call it Kantianism or something like that. Um, Immanuel Kant, still very influential in modern ethics. Kant thought that some acts like murder are just intrinsically wrong and just inherently wrong. It is never right to take a life, even if you save 30 people in return. Uh, you know, it's like in, in the Avengers, if you guys have seen that like Infinity War movie, right? Kantians don't trade lives, right? They don't trade one life for 30 lives or even, even, even one life for a billion lives because murder is always wrong and you're never going to create you know goodness in the world by using evil acts to do it so you got to stick with what is intrinsically right that's kantianism or like deontological ethics it's sometimes called anyway uh, there are more schools of thought than this if you were to take like a modern ethics class but broadly speaking like those are the parameters to get us started thinking about this scene um, in one sense starbuck could be seen as like rejecting utilitarian thinking when he walks away, trusting instead to God's divine command, like in a Kantian sort of way, thou shalt not kill, it's just absolute. In another sense though, Starbuck could be seen as like a coward who lets his piety and his self image as a virtuous man get in the way of what is the mathematically correct, you know, utilitarian answer. If you're a utilitarian, you know, 30 outweighs one. Um, and these people are really going to die because of your high-minded code of ethics, Starbuck. Um, it would be profoundly immoral to sacrifice others' lives for your own abstract moral ideals. Uh, that's the other way of looking at it. I don't know. I have no idea what to do. These are like pretty abstract questions, um, but you could also see how they could get concrete, con concrete very quickly. Um, sometimes these questions become real. Uh, in the 1940s in Germany, um, there was a Lutheran pastor and, and theologian named, named Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, and he was involved in this plot to kill Hitler. Like they snuck this bomb into one of Hitler's war rooms and it goes off and it kills like two of Hitler's aides, but, but not Hitler himself, Hitler's fine. Uh, and because he's a monomaniac like Ahab, Hitler takes this as a sign that he's invincible. And he should just continue on his like mad purpose, uh, like Ahab sailing through the storm without lightning rods, because he's like, you know, nothing can touch me. Um, this analogy with with Starbuck uh, is is, is it that that this Lutheran pastor Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was actually willing to die. He was willing to pull the trigger on that musket. He was willing to to um, commit murder, possibly go to hell, according to his beliefs for breaking God's commandment in order to save, you know, several million innocent people and not just 30, but 30, a million, it doesn't matter. Um, it's still like almost, almost a utilitarian logic there. It, it could be, uh, maybe not though. Um, Bonhoeffer was willing to set aside his own code of ethics to murder. I don't know if that makes him a calculating utilitarian or, or something else entirely, a kind of sacrificial figure who is willing to die for, for others and die to himself and die to his own sense of right and wrong even, die to his principles so that others can live um, in almost like a Christ-like way. But who gets to make that call? I don't know. 
Anyway, these are all interesting question, questions that are raised by the musket chapter. I really have no idea how to answer them. So hit me up with some of your thoughts on the response sheet. I am curious to know more. Um, okay, next we have the needle, wherein the compass of the Pequod gets totally reversed in the lightning storm. And this sometimes happens, right? Uh, uh, and for just a bit there, they're headed in the right direction. They're headed back home, uh, which for Ahab is actually the wrong direction because he has his own compass needles reversed morally. And like what's right for him uh, is the wrong direction for everybody else. And what's wrong for him is right for everybody else. Anyway, this of course reminds us of a book four in Paradise Lost, um, when Satan says um, famously, evil be thou my good, right? Evil be thou my good. Um, that's Ahab, you know, his compass needles is, are reversed. Evil is now his good, good is now his evil. Um, Ahab is sort of the most satanic character in modern literature in this Milt Miltonic sense. Um, but remember, there are lots of reasons to sympathize with Milton's Satan because the worst is nothing but a corruption of the best, which means that there really is a lot of good in Ahab somewhere, or at least there was potentially before it was corrupted. Um, and this strong sense of self uh, became an assertion of self in, in defiance of, of God and, and justice. Um, anyway, the point of this chapter is that Ahab's moral compass needle is flipped, right? It's polarized, it's been reversed. Um, good and evil now point in the wrong directions for Ahab. As for Satan, evil be now my good. You've read Paradise Lost, you get the picture. Um, next, the life buoy chapter. The life buoy is great. Uh, they lose their life preserver when someone goes overboard in the night. And so they actually don't, so they, they don't have one. They need a new one. Uh, but here's Queequeg's coffin, which Queequeg doesn't need anymore since he has decided to live after all. Uh, so let's just cock up the coffin and then it's a floating, you know, thing that Ahab calls an immortality preserver uh, instead of a life or mortality preserver. And the idea here is probably best expressed by the writer um, E.M. Forster, um, who once said, you know, uh, death destroys a man, but the idea of death saves him, right? In a way, so death destroys a man, but the idea of death saves him. In a way, the, the, the coffin can be like a reminder of our own death and in that way save us for immortality. It can be an immortality preserver. Um, on Perusal last week, I think I quoted you this long passage from a Trappist monk named Thomas Merton. And the Trappists in their monastery would actually sleep every night in their own coffins instead of like sleeping in beds. Their beds were their own coffins to remind themselves that they would die one day. And so they shouldn't waste um, a moment. They shouldn't waste this beautiful morning. They shouldn't waste any opportunity to love the person in front of them. Um, and and it's because they have, they've got death hanging over them that can make them like a more loving person. Death destroys a man. The idea of death saves him. This is a very old, very powerful idea proximity to death brings us closer to life, um, that our lives take on meaning and value in light of their finitude and their brevity. Um, it's hard to say anything more about this. You know, when we're young, we feel invincible. And and so uh, it doesn't always hit home. Uh, but just note that, that the coffin is there as like an immortality preserver, ironically, um, uh, because it's a coffin, it's a symbol of death. Um, but it's capable of keeping the soul afloat in the stormy seas, um, this idea of, of, of death. So um, the Moby Dick yesterday, right? So we're really close. We're like so close. Um, and that Rachel is actually going to reappear at another crucial moment uh, in the last reading here. So, so note um, some things about the Rachel here. The Rachel, this is a really significant encounter. Um, a problem at hand uh, in this chapter, when we meet the Rachel, though, is that the Rachel has lost one of its whale boats pursuing Moby Dick. The old Manxman on the, the Pequod, who, let's face it, is kind of cryptic and a little creepy. Um, the Manxman says he knows that, that the crew in that whale boat drowned last night because he heard their voices somehow calling out from the deep. Um, and he's, you know, the, everybody defers to him because he's, he's like the most experienced, you know, old sailor. Um, but the captain of the Rachel tells Ahab, look, my son was on that missing boat. I, and he begs Ahab, he pleads with him, he offers to pay Ahab, you know, whatever he wants. Um, if the Pequod will only, you know, stop hunting 
for a little bit and come search with them. He says, uh, this is uh, 5.34. It's just such a moving passage. I think it's the very top of 5.34. Um, he says, just for eight and 40 hours only, only that you must, oh, you must, oh, you shall do this thing. And, you know, he, Ahab stood still like an anvil. And, and the captain of the Pequod says, you know, I will not go till you say I to me. Um, do to me as you would have me do to you in the like case, for you too have a boy, Captain Ahab. So they kind of know each other from back home. And Ahab is like, I will not do it even now. Even now I lose time. Goodbye, goodbye. I'm off to hunt the whale. And I don't have any time to, to help you look for your son. It is an intense passage. And here we see Ahab in the full, ugly light of, of his wickedness, right? Remember, he's a wicked, wicked king uh, of Israel. And he lives up to his name. Um, how can Ahab refuse this father in search of his child? Um, you should give up anything that you're doing to do that. Um, but refuse, he does. Um, the final line in this chapter um, clues us in to, to some of the symbolism of this ship's name, the Rachel. Um, in the book of Genesis, Rachel is the name of Jacob's second and favored wife, uh, from whom the tribes of Israel descend. Uh, later in the book of Jeremiah, from which we get the genre of the Jeremiad, um, the Israelites uh, have been taken captive by the Babylonians. This is all like Old Testament history. And the prophet Jeremiah tells us um, that, that he, he can almost hear Rachel, um, the sort of ancient ancestor of, of the people of Israel. He can hear Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted for they are no more. Okay, so that's the famous image, and 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 this gets quoted in the New Testament too. Um, you know, when when uh, Herod comes and, and slaughters all the the, the babies um, in Bethlehem because he's trying to, you know, he's heard that a new Messiah has been born, so he's trying to like off all the little children, and it's this horrible um, scene that is like right surrounding the the birth of Jesus and the Christmas story. Um, but Rachel gets quoted there too. Um, she is a, a mother weeping for her children uh, who refuses to be comforted, who cannot be comforted. She is a figure of loss and sadness that is beyond all telling, right? Um, Melville likes this, right? There, He thinks there is indeed a great woe in the world that is worth weep, weeping over, a great loss that cannot be restored. Um, but, but Ahab doesn't even try, right? Uh, that doesn't mean you're, you, even if you know it's futile, um, you got to help this guy out, right? Um, try to help Captain Gardner of the Rachel. Ahab just sails on looking for his own revenge. Uh, families and friends, these things are some of the realest and best comforts that we have in an often comfortless world, but, but Ahab chooses to reject even those. Um, it's like, you know, inhuman of him almost, you, you feel as a reader. Immediately after this, though, we see um, a softer side of Ahab in chapter 129, the cabin, the side of him that um, inflicts wounds on others because he is wounded. Um, he can't comfort others because he will not be comforted. And he has this interesting dialogue with Pip, um, who's almost a kindred spirit, um, even though an unlikely one. They're both mad, Ahab says, and, and, and like cures like, right? Madness cures madness. Um, but Ahab's not ready to let go of his madness just yet. You'll have to read this part a little more closely because um, we're running out of time and I want to talk about the symphony chapter, uh, which is just so good. Um, so we're glossing over some of this stuff quickly. Um, they meet another ship, the Delight, uh, ironically named because um, life on the Delight is very sad. They've also lost some men to Moby Dick and, and contrary to their name, um, are mourning uh, for those men as well. These are more bad signs, clearly. Melville is stacking up ill omens. Um, uh, you know, a black hawk at one point swoops down, you know, and steals something from Ahab. And, and, and we're, we're just, we're seeing here all these reasons and all these opportunities for them to turn around. And of course they don't do it. Um, Ahab's purpose is fixed on iron rails. And then chapter 132, this is the one that I really want to talk about, um, the symphony. I would like to think that if Melville had written nothing else in his whole career except this chapter, the symphony, 
he still would be considered one of our just irreproachably great American authors. It's just this stunning portrait of, of a summer's day, you know, the, the sweet childhood of air and sky, he says. Um, but it's also, at the same time, an intimate portrait of a soul, of Ahab's soul, that is all but drowned in the depths of lostness and loneliness and despair. And Ahab says, oh, for 40 years, I've been making war on the horrors of the deep. And yet it's this like beautiful summer day. And, and there's a little in literature, I think, aside from, from maybe, maybe a few passages in Shakespeare or Milton that can compare with the pathos of this juxtaposition. So, so just read it, right? Read it slowly, read it out loud if you can. Uh, Immanuel Kant, famously said two things uh, fill him with awe. This is the start of one of his big books. He says, there are two things that fill me with awe. Number one, the, scar the starry sky above me. And, and number two, the moral law within me, right? The starry sky above me and the moral law within me. In other words, there's this infinite that is all around us. And there's this infinite that is inside us. And somehow in this chapter, Melville fuses a sense of these two infinities um, of the, and, and makes Ahab sort of the point at which these two infinities meet. And you just cannot help but feel when reading it, you know, what a profound and precious thing it is to be alive in this world, to have a self, to live this life sad and lonely, though it may often be um, amid such um, uh, beauty. So, it's a great chapter. Um, for a brief moment, at the top of 544 in this chapter, uh, the day is just so lovely that Ahab almost relents on his quest. From somewhere inside him, right, this tear <laughs> falls into the ocean, and Melville writes, nor did all the Pacific contain such wealth as that one we drop as that tear. As fascinated as Melville is with the non-human world, uh, you know, with creatures and the forces of nature that are just like beyond us, he is still at the end of the day, a good old fashioned humanist, right? He treasures the specialness of human experience in his art. Under a chemist's microscope, maybe a tear and like a drop from the Pacific Ocean look about the same, right? There's some H2O, there's some salty sodium chloride, but, but there is a difference in the tear that makes all the difference. The tear is, is a product of the human mind contemplating its situation in the world. In other words, you know, nothing else does that. <laughs> in other words, the tear contains a meaning, right? Meaning um, outweighs the entire ocean one drop of meaning outweighs the world. There is no proportion. There is no relation between meaning and quantity, right? You could take the entire Pacific Ocean and, and one human tear um, outweighs it. One human life outweighs everything somehow. Um, it's weird, um, but Whitman may have been right, you know, when he said that, that any man or woman should stand cool and composed before a million universes, right? It's just one of those truths that become true to the extent that we assert it and believe it to be true. And that's what, you know, his, that sort of innate humanism is, is about. Um, Melville's trying to drive home also the sense of wonder at, at the lives that we lead, a sense of what it is that, that is about to be lost as the Pequod plunges forward. At this point, uh, we finally also get a little bit of Ahab's backstory. Uh, we learn that he struck his first whale at 18 and he has, hasn't been home, you know, more than three years in the last 40, you know, combined. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's moving to, to hear this um, and humanizing. Uh, he says, on such a day, very much a sweetness, very, very much such a sweetness as this, I struck my first whale, a boy harpoon here of 18, 40, 40, 40 years ago, 40 years of continual whaling, 
40 years of privation and peril and storm time. 40 years on the pitiless sea. For 40 years has Ahab forsaken the peaceful land. For 40 years to make war on the horrors of the deep. And yes, in Starbuck, out of those 40 years, I have not spent three ashore. When I think of this life I have led, the desolation of solitude it has been, the masoned, walled town of a captain's exclusiveness, which admits but small entrance to any sympathy from the green country without, oh, weariness, heaviness, Guinea coast slavery of solitary command. When I think of all this, only half suspected, not so keenly known to me before, et cetera, et cetera, he goes on. Uh, uh, he just says, um, when I think of all this, the question occurs to me, why, right? Why this strife of this chase? You know, am I any richer for it? He says, um, it's, a, it's a weary load. And he, I am Adam staggering beneath the piled centuries since paradise and God crack my heart and stave my brain. And, and he is trying to really just sort of sum up and reckon um, with his choices. Um, and this is a guy who like a chapter or two ago was on deck waving a flaming harpoon theatrically and giving speeches about defying heaven. And it turns out that inside he's lonely and he's lost and he's wondering whether it has all been worth it. Um, just like any of us would when we come to these, these crossroads in our lives. And um, Melville has this sense that, that behind every ordinary human life, there's, there's a world of sorrow and of memory and a depth of feeling that is, is often hidden away, um, even from ourselves. Um, in, in every important sense, um, we are mysteries, even to ourselves. Um, and yet there are these moments of recognition uh, where who we are catches up to us and we are astonished and we are moved um, by who we have been and, and by who we could be. Here, Starbuck seizes his chance and says, Ahab, no, this isn't worth it. You can see that. Of course it's not worth it. Let's go home and let's see our families again. It'd be fun <laughs> to sail into Nantucket Harbor. Our sons are probably waiting for us on top of the sand dunes, watching for our sails to come home. Uh, and he is trying one last time to, to press his point. I just think it's marvelous that the, even like a blustery, blasphemous old crab like Ahab uh, actually has somebody who cares for him back home, right? Everyone is someone's son. Everyone is someone's father, someone's brother, someone's friend. Um, no man is an island unto himself. Each one of us has more than enough uh, to live for, if only we will stop to realize it. Um, and Starbuck is saying, it's not too late to turn from the path we've been on. You know, It's not too late to become better, to turn away from darkness and death and choose light and life instead. It's never too late if that's what we want. Ahab just doesn't want it. Right? He feels that he is fated. Uh, on the next page, he, he gives in to this kind of, uh, you know, um, determinism and, and fatalism. And he says, you know, is Ahab Ahab? Is it I, God, or who that lifts this arm? If the great sun move not itself, but is an errand boy in heaven, nor can any single star re revolve, but by some invisible power, how then can this one small heart beat, this one small brain think thoughts, unless God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living, not I. And so Ahab, uh, you know, at a crucial moment kind of abdicates his free will and says, no, it has to be this way. This is just how it is. This is how things were, were made. Um, so um, Ahab is a man uh, full of, of contradictions, it seems. Um, but uh, that's also part of the, the infiniteness of, of, of being human is, you know, do I, con with a Whitman line, do I contradict myself very well? I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Um, Melville ends this section with two images at the bottom of 546 that I just, I can't get over these. Um, the first one is very Jobian. Ahab says, who's to doom when the judge himself is dragged to the bar? Who's to doom when the judge himself is dragged to the bar? Meaning I think that if there is any justice in the universe, it doesn't always seem to translate for us in a comprehensible way. That whatever justice is, 
uh, in life simply cannot be accounted for in standards that humanity can recognize. So the moral order threatens always to become arbitrary or unintelligible whenever bad things happen to us. Ahab saying, look, whoever made this leaky and broken universe um, has some explaining to do still. Um, and un until then, that judge, that kind of God, is in no position to judge us for our brokenness and our leakiness, for our neediness and insufficiencies. Um, so Ahab says, I will drag him to the bar to be judged. Right? The sentence has decided to pass judgment on its author. The creation has decided to judge its creator, right? to judge God, to judge the devil, to judge right and wrong and himself, uh, which really means that maybe there is no judge um, except for us. There's no one here but, but us alone at sea with our ineradicable intuitions of right and wrong, of meaning and emptiness, and, and no power really to enforce any of them. Um, we just have the will to be oneself, to be one's own judge. That's the position that Ahab has arrived at here. Um, and once Ahab is this far gone, there really is no going back, and Starbuck knows it. He becomes pale, and he steals away. But remember the book of Job. When Job asks again and again, what is justice? What is justice? God does give a kind of answer. It's just not the answer that we're looking for necessarily. Um, it's unexpected. The answer is, of course, beauty, right? This is God's answer from the whirlwind in Job. He says, you know, beauty and not justice seems to be the point of things deep down. And so the message of, at the end of Job is, is just look. Right? Look for the beauty, look for the mystery of being. That's as close as we can get to seeing what's behind it, it all. And, and you might have to let go of this notion of, of, of justice and judges. So the conversation with Starbuck closes on this, like almost, I don't know quite what to make of it. It's a, it's a mysteriously beautiful image um, of mowers in the Andes mountains cutting fresh hay. And, and I confess, you know, I don't fully understand it, but it's just this piece of, of poetry that I would not trade for all the salt in the Pacific Ocean. And it seems to contain some echo of God's answer to Job, that, that this world is a beautiful place despite it all. Now, Ahab, in this moment of, of like um, uh, vulnerability and inspiration, says that, that maybe we're like last year's scythes, you know, these cutting tools, um, flung down on the field to rust amid the world's ever-growing greenness with the work of mowing still only half finished um, so I'll read you this, this image here um, that I just love. This is the end of, of chapter 132, the symphony. <sighs> Who's to doom when the judge himself is dragged to the bar? But it is a mild, mild wind and a mild-looking sky, and the air smells now as if it blew from a faraway meadow. They have been making hay, somewhere under the slopes of the Andes, Starbuck, and the mowers are sleeping among the new mown hay. Sleeping? Aye. Toil how we may, we all sleep at last on the field. Sleep? Aye. And rust amid greenness, as last year's scythes flung down and left in the half-cut swaths, Starbuck. We will never get to the bottom of these questions, Ahab seems to suggest, any more than a tool can understand the purpose for which it's being used. Um, perhaps there is some comfort in that. When, when we're used up, we're flung into the tall grass, and we're not remembered any longer than that, but maybe that's okay. Maybe there's some comfort in that. At some point, we must all lie down to sleep, uh, but here it is a peaceful sleep, the sleep of one who has labored honestly as in a field of spring hay at dusk. This is the last moment of something like tranquility in the book. Uh, you'll notice that the very next chapter is called The Chase, Day One, uh, which means we're about to meet Moby Dick and we're almost done. We're going to pause here a little bit, though. It is Memorial Day weekend, so we're going to take Monday off, and we're going to read some Frederick Douglass next week, and that way we'll be able to finish Moby Dick with a bang uh, at our last full week of school before finals. We're almost there. Uh, so don't lie down and sleep in the spring hay yet. Um, that'll come soon. But um, for now, uh, enjoy this spring day, and I will see you guys later.